Thank you. Hi, right, thanks everyone. Um, I'll try and keep this on time, even slightly quicker if I can, because I know we're a little bit behind schedule, so thanks for uh, coming back. So um, I'll be presenting about the web focus group that we did as part of this bigger research project within um, working group three with the interest in um, non-archaeologists, non-professionals, and how they engage with digital knowledge production. And the group that me and my colleagues looked at was uh, hobbyist metal detectorists. It's a group that the three of us, uh, myself, Irma Lynn, and Vikendas, have worked with in different ways, both as uh, for research purposes to actually study detectorists themselves, but also as potential collaborators. Um, so just to give a little quick overview, uh, some of you may be less familiar with metal detectorists as a group. So first of all, what is metal detecting? Well, it depends who you ask, really. Um, it's a very controversial area. In some countries, it's illegal. In other countries, it's a so-called liberal model where it's, it is possible to metal detect in certain circumstances. And this has led to them being uh, perceived not only by the archaeological community, but by the wider society in different ways. So we've had headlines from places like United Kingdom calling them the unsung heroes of heritage uh, because of the data that they've produced and their willingness especially if, if collaboration and, and public relations go the right way, to share that information with archaeologists and others. But we also see them vilified and demonized as terrible people with sarcastic suggestions that they're genuinely interested in the past in a way that suggests they're really not at all. This is a poster from 1981, the, the infamous Stop campaign in England and Wales and Scotland. Um, which was an attempt from the archaeological community spearheaded by Council for British Archaeology to get metal detecting banned. Uh, a similar campaign was carried out also in Denmark a couple of years later. Uh, suffice to say, it didn't work. Metal detecting wasn't banned. And although there are a number of countries, I think Sweden, for example, where it isn't really possible to metal detect legally, there are places where it is possible. And this was one of the things that we were quite interested in with this project. So. A bit of personal background on this, I actually did my PhD on the relationships between archaeologists and metal detectorists, so it's been a sort of sticky area that I've been fascinated by for a very long time, and I currently work on a project in Finland to develop a finds recording database. Finland is a country where metal detecting is permitted, and as the hobby grows in popularity, it's very important to ensure that data is captured and uh, it's my feeling and feeling of many of my colleagues that you don't do that by criticizing and demonizing and otherizing, othering people. You do it by making them collaborators, by embracing uh, principles of citizen science and working together. So the project we have in Finland at the moment called Find Sampo, and this was a recent uh, trip out near Pordovo to test the app, is to create a, a, an app that detectors can use in the field to get exact locations of their discoveries, to take pictures and so on. Obviously it wouldn't work in every context, but in Finland so far it seems to work. So, um, given uh, my own interest in the possible use of mobile apps and other things, um, it became clear as we were trying to decide which uh, group to target with our web focus group exercise that metal detectorists clearly do use quite a broad range of different di digital tools in their activity. Of course they use GPS, uh, some actually are built into metal detectors themselves, so the metal detector, as well as a mechanical device, becomes very much a digitally connected device as well. Um, in some countries, there are mobile apps. Some are provided by the state. Some are created by detectorists themselves or adapted in different ways. Some countries, such as uh, England and Wales, Netherlands, um, Denmark, have state-supported find databases where the state actually invests in collating the data from metal detectorists and making that archaeologically available for research. Um, some detectorists create their own databases, whether it's on an individual private level or at the level, level of their club, and these databases vary of how open they are to others to look at. Um, they all seem to use social media in different ways, and I'll come on to that more a bit later on, and it's quite interesting after what Ingrid was saying to think about how detectorists view things like Facebook and the, and the functions it has for them. It's slightly different, I think, to the more sort of 
broad archaeological groups. Um, they also, uh, for research purposes, use things like online maps and other resources. And of course, they access archaeological reports and articles. So this open access movement also benefits amateur, non-professional researchers, including people who use metal detectors. So the focus group itself, this is just a, a table of the uh, people we were able to um, attract to our focus group. Um, we carried it out using Skype for Business so that we were able to record the focus group as it went on. Uh, we found out during that process that there were certain limitations. For example, we thought we could see everybody at the same time, but it turns out the recording only records the person who's talking. You don't see anybody else. So we. We missed, although we were taking notes during the web focus group, um, non-vocal signals like nodding or laughing and, and things like that. So uh, that was sort of something we had to pay attention to at the same time because it wasn't necessarily captured by the video recording. Uh, we also had some technical issues. So uh, Noah from Denmark was only able to join textually. He could hear us and see us, but we couldn't see him. So we had to type in his answers from time to time. So he participated in the web focus group another way. And Jakob from Poland was unable to join the focus group at the time and also had some concerns about his language. So he preferred to respond over email to the questions. We sent him the themes that we were going to discuss during the focus group. So we, we did our best with the resources and the, the timing and so on that we had. In terms of ethical considerations, there were a lot especially working with human subjects. Uh, we were careful to pseudonymize the, the texturists. So the names you saw just then aren't their actual names, although they are the countries that they come from. And we're not going to, in our uh, analysis and reporting of this, un uh, reference any quotations that could positively identify them. So if they're in charge of a particular Facebook group, I'm not going to tell you, for example. Um, we had to also consider uh, the legal status of metal detecting in different European countries. So. Needless to say, this was a barrier to participation. It was far more difficult for obvious reasons to recruit metal detectors from countries where it's illegal. It's probably more difficult to get people to talk about something that they know isn't uh, allowed in the law than it is from the lib liberal countries where it is possible. So there were limitations in terms of the, the, the people that we could approach. Um, it's also, of course, a very small group. It's, we, we don't know for sure whether it's representative or not. In a way, it's self-selecting. We found a lot of the participants through personal connections or colleagues of colleagues, and they tended to be detectorists who are already having some dialogue and collaboration with archaeologists, which certainly isn't the case of the entire community. So um, very roughly, and I have to qualify this by saying that we're still in the process of doing the analysis, so some more things may come out too, but we found that there were broadly three phases in which metal detectorists were using digital tools for their knowledge production and for their research. Uh, phase one, we've just very broadly called the pre-detecting research stage. And these are a couple of quotes just to give you an idea. I don't have videos, I'm afraid. Again, for, for anonymization reasons. Um, but uh, Mattis from Lithuania, for example, said, we use all accessible data on the internet. We educate ourselves. We will look for the sources. We will read the works of archeologists. So this is the work they do before they go into the field. Uh, Onni from Finland said, you know those old maps that are made in silk paper and you have to place in the top of the kind of original map to see the spot? And then when we're kind of digitalizing those images, we have to scan and edit and use quite a lot of different programs. For example, MapTiler is one that I use, GPS, of course, and basically any good quality map application that I can use with the, mo the mobile phone. So they're already digitizing themselves at this stage in some cases. Uh, Lucas from Belgium says, uh, also showing that online maps are, are used, that luckily we have old maps, and the first thing that the metal detectorist will do is going online and checking the old maps. The second stage we saw was the, the during detecting process stage. So this is when they're actually in the field performing the action of metal detecting. Metal detecting itself is only a small part of the hobby you've probably gathered by now. There's a lot of work before and after too. Uh, but George from England, for example, says there's certainly one or two new apps coming out for some of the current smartphones, which will allow you to take a find, photograph it, speak details about it, which it will write GPS and then send it home to your computer. So they're really doing quite sophisticated uh, data collection in some cases. Um, Noah referring to one of these state-run 
databases uh, says that in Denmark we always use GPS and we use the DEMA app and mobile version. This is a recently launched uh, mobile app and find database specifically for Danish metal detectorists to report discoveries. Uh, Mattis of Lithuania says we use all accessible GPS devices to take coordinates and all possible photo fixation, means from drones to photo cameras to GoPro cameras, all possible stuff. And I think this is also um, a typical thing maybe of, of many hobbyists that they're very interested in gadgets as well and, and different um, types of devices that they can use. The third phase is the post-detecting, reporting and recording stage. This is after they've been in the field. And there were different views and discussions on this. So one thing that was brought up in a lot of the discussion was the legal obligation in different countries. And Lucas says the only legal obligation for Belgium, or more specifically Flanders, because it's illegal in Wallonia, uh, is to log into the Heritage Agency's website and to fill in what you found and point it out in the fields where it's been uh, found. Uh, George references the Portable Antiquities Scheme, the longest running of the state-sponsored uh, finds databases for detectorists and he's a self-recorder which means he's been doing it for long enough that he's trusted to do self-recording he doesn't have to go through a finds liaison officer an archaeologist to do this um, there were also criticisms so Anders from Norway was talking about the Unimus portal uh, which I believe is in Oslo when in Oslo and he says he, although he uses it on, on a weekly basis he can't use it for identifying or anything he goes to Facebook because it's quicker so he's using his online community to also get identification of, of fines. And then Jakob from Poland, and this is a country where it's much more difficult to do legal metal detecting. There's a number of permits that you need to get and they're very difficult usually to get hold of. Uh, he has a, his own self-created database and he says it's for his private purposes only, not shared with anybody else on the internet. So just for his personal research. So to talk about social media and the role of that specifically because it was one of the types of engagement that came up time and time again. It's not just used for uh, communication, of course it is used for talking to other detectorists and also other archaeologists. In many cases, archaeologists are also members of the metal detecting Facebook groups. So there is dialogue going on, at least online. It's used to identify finds, so people share discoveries with each other and they um, get, get feedback of what it might be and, and you find very often that the more experienced sort of older detectorists will give advice to newer ones and this ranges from uh, identifying fines through to ad advising them of what they are obligated to do legally or, or what the best practice would be so reminding them to go to somewhere like Portable Antiquity Scheme or DEMA for example. Um, it's also many discussed that there used to be sort of in the late 90s early 2000s a lot of online web forums, if you remember these things, and they were very popular with detectorists. There's a couple still exist. There's one uh, in Finland, for example, with Arda Manala, which still goes. Um, but for the most part, Facebook's taken over from these discussion forums, so people have migrated to the Facebook pages. Uh, this provides some challenges, especially if you want to do ethnographic research of detectorists, because it's harder to get the archived material of discussions from Facebook than it used to be from forums. Uh, some of them also use YouTube, they post videos of, of themselves uh, out in the field and they use inter Instagram. But they also discussed quite a bit uh, security issues and the quote from Anders here is quite typical. He says the biggest problem with especially open Facebook groups is that they're feeding the Nighthawks. For those of you who don't know, Nighthawk is the nickname for illegal detectorists. So there is a fear of, of signifying and signposting vulnerable sites to uh, more criminal elements. Um, and so often one of the things, again, that experienced detectorists will do with new ones is, is advise them not to give exact fine spots when they're sharing what they found because it makes the site vulnerable to, to looting um, later on. Other security issues uh, have been to do with personal security as well. One of the uh, discussants had a quite disturbing anecdote of somebody figuring out who he was through the Facebook page and following him and he had this quite disturbing experience. So there were sometimes even, unfortunately, uh, personal security issues too. Uh, the other key, big thing that came up aside from social media as a sort of unifying theme that everybody was interested in was this idea of having state-sponsored recording way, um, databases, linked open data and so on that others can use. And this was partly 
a wish to contribute and then to feel that uh, the, the work of your hobby has also contributed to archaeological knowledge production. And, for example, in England and Wales, there are a number of PhDs that have been done exactly off portable antiquity scheme data. So it isn't simply lip service to uh, appease these unsung heroes. It really is uh, robust data that's being produced. And there was always also envy from other countries. So all of the other participants who weren't from Denmark uh, wanted the Danish way of doing things. This was a phrase that got uh, mentioned a couple of times at the recent launching of DEMA, not just the, the database side of it, but the fact there's an app that you can record in the field. This was uh, envied by many who felt they wanted to have the DEMA system adopted in their own country and, and simply brought across. So, um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, okay, I guess? Seven minutes, oh gosh, wow, okay. I'll I'll go very, I don't need to speak, yes, yeah. Probably you'll be happy if I don't speak for seven minutes, so. Um, so just to conclude then, um, as I said before, there's still a lot of uh, analysis to go on with this. We've been coding the um, focus group. We first transcribed it, and, and now we're sort of going through with Atlas TI and other programs to code and try and, and find themes that are emerging. But it's very clear uh, that metal detectorists have adopted digital tools throughout all the different aspects of their hobby, not just, uh, or at least not least, the, the metal detector itself, but many other forms as well. Um, they participate in active knowledge production. Uh, some of them create and maintain private databases, um, but according to our sample at least, they also use these state-supported national and regional, da regional databases where they're available. And in countries where these aren't available yet, there's a great deal of envy and, and wishing and longing that, that something like that would be available to them where they are. Um, again, according to our samples, so we can't extrapolate to the entire community, but certainly uh, the people we spoke to in the web focus group um, described using digital tools in, in all three phases that I mentioned before. So for the pre-detecting research phase, for the uh, during detecting work in the field, and for post-detecting work, including recording, um, having social engagement, there's a certain level of um, sort of fulfillment that comes from uh, getting acknowledgement from your uh, contemporaries of having a good find or, or displaying expertise through identifying and so on. And of course for finds identification with each other too and with archaeologists through platforms like Facebook. Uh, some of them discuss security issues. Uh, some of this was also to do with data protection um, but it was also to do with something that's come up in a lot of other ethnographic research of detectorists and in more traditional ways with interviews and, and go along where you go in the field and, and talk with them whilst they're metal detecting. And this was this um, issue that detectorists can quite become uh, product, uh, protective of productive sites. So if a detectorist has permission to go in a particular field and they feel it's a, a very uh, productive area for them, they, they will be quite reticent of letting others know, and this has actually also been a barrier with some of the finds databases that are fear that exact finds being shared online would make these places more vulnerable to others uh, going there. Um, finally, these insights are very important, um, obviously for the process and feeding into this bigger project of looking at how different uh, communities uh, work with and then produce archaeological knowledge. But it also has quite a practical implication. Um, these insights are very important for organizations and, and archaeological groups who do seek to enhance engagement with detectorists. Um, there's a lot of, and I see this a lot in my own research and in what I read from others, a lot of mind reading that goes on and assumptions made about the values of detectorists. And so the more we can actually know for sure without making these assumptions and doing this mind reading, the better. Uh, but it's also important for um, understanding how projects uh, that may collaborate with them could, could work more successfully. How do we make sure that the detectorists also feel they're getting something out of it? It's not just a one-way street. And uh, the processes and the values within the community can be uh, more diverse and perhaps more interesting than, than you'd first think. So that's it. Nice little natty ring from Finland to finish off. Thank you very much.